Hi everybody, Jonathan Scott here with the Big Cat Family and welcome to our YouTube. I hope you'll press that little button to register so you're going to know anytime we have some new content for you. And uh, two types of videos, top tips for photography and then behind the scenes of some of our favourite images from um, our fine art gallery. And one of those images that we know has drawn huge attention and rightly so, a beautiful picture of Angie's of Toto, Honey and Toto, two of the stars of Big Cat Diary 2005. And this little cheetah broke people's hearts. And I'm going to tell you something about Honey and Toto's story today, but in relation to being a photographer. Because in 2005, when we filmed Honey and Toto, um, it was a cheetah mum, Honey, that Angie and I had known for a number of years. She was born in 1998 down near the Tanzania border. And um, we had tracked her because we saw here was an incredible story of a mother cheetah who was regularly raising cubs in the uh, whole of her lifespan. Uh, she had four litters. She raised eight cubs successfully. That's a 48% success rate against the cheetah Kike, who famously crapped on my head, and who her success rate was only 18% in her lifetime. She raised three cubs, Honey raised eight, and she lived until she was seven or eight years old, died in February uh, 2007. But a little bit more on that story later. It's a very poignant story. But Angie has always worked as the um, production stills photographer and also a spotter helping us to find our animals and in this instance finding honey on Big Cat Diary. And during the period that we followed honey we could see there was just this, this incredible story as I say of her journey through the trials and tribulations of trying to raise cubs in a very high density predator area such as the Masai Mara where we do all our big cat work where there are so many lions and hyenas. So 2005 we came across Honey with this tiny little cub. I mean you could have put him in the outstretched palms of your hands. Just this tiny fluffy ball of fur, about three months old. Uh, he was a male, obviously the survivor of a bigger litter. Cheetahs often have up to six cubs. The record's actually ten, not that they survived. And we just knew as storytellers, as photographers, certainly from the video aspect, let's think of that first. For the video aspect, here was a mother with a single cub, so very easy for our audiences to identify and bond with this single little cub. No confusion, which one is it amongst, you know, a bigger litter? And then there was Honey herself, who we knew, and so she was a character. And as we've so often said, we know some of these big cats better than our friends. We see them more often than our friends. And um, so a great story. And over the month that we filmed for Big Cat uh, Week 2005, it was a roller coaster. So there was every element to drive the story. There were interactions with lions, with hyenas, and famously with baboons, where Honey tried to distract one of these or two male baboons while little Toto escaped. And I had to think, am I going to intervene? No, I can't. You can't play God. And um, so just lots of opportunities. And for Angie as the stills photographer, she could start to build a portfolio. And remember, Whenever you're with storytellers, doesn't matter whether you're an artist with paint and brush, whether you're a photographer, um, uh, you know, whether you're a writer, this is about storytelling. And so Angie could begin to see an unfolding story of portraits, of mid shots, of the big scene, of the cheetahs out in the landscape. And but one of the things that Angie is is so good at is immersing herself quietly in the lives of these cats and show. So there were all kinds of opportunities. I mean, look at that glorious picture, intimate of the two cheetahs on a termite mound, as often a cheetah will want to do, get up high so as it can look around, check for danger. Look at the light, that golden hour, that 10 minutes in the morning when the sun first pops over the horizon, and that last 10 minutes in the evening, and Angie choosing to go side-lit or back-lit to just get mood and emotion into the picture. And it's so intimate. 
as as if you're you know a voyeur there's no sense that you are participating or interfering the cat honey is just in this lovely moment with the tiny cub just greeting just looking up they're going to be playful and of course for little toto honey was his whole world. So an incredible story to depict. And obviously, as I say, as a photographer, as a stills photographer, you don't have the benefit of the moving image. You have to create moments in time and you want variety. You want to be able to cover the whole story. You want to think of the double page spread. You want to think of the details and of the portraits. Now, one of the things that we always say, the key to actually being, you know, really being a wildlife photographer is to choose your subject and then to learn as much as possible as you can about your subject so as you can predict the behavior. And so we've always kept, um, we're great sort of, you know, diarists. So we keep diaries on these big cats. And here's some of the images that we've collected over time of Honey. So this is Honey's story. And as I say, born in 1998, and uh, here she is again. So this was 2004, when in fact she had a litter of four cubs, and those cubs and her got mange, so a mite infestation. And we recorded the facts. And so again, an evolving story, but a continuing story. Uh, you don't just sort of, you know, you, what we tend to do is have a number of stories running concurrently, but one story may stall. For instance, when I was working on leopards in the early days, it took me six years to actually get sufficient pictures of a leopard to go with the story that I was telling. Six years. But you invest that time. And by having a number of strands, a number of stories, you can keep building, keep adding until the moment is right. And then here, honey here with the four cubs in that particular time. So this was April 2004. This was her third, this was her second litter. Sorry, her third litter. And here you can see one of our favorite lionesses, Carly, an old lioness, mother of Bibi, who came across the river and stole the cheetah's kill. And then here, so the story, you know, continuing. So 2004, as I say, April, honey got mange. And she had to be treated by vets. And you can see here, Kashmiri, wonderful vet who was sadly killed by an elephant doing his job. Um, he sedated it, gave it the antidote, it got up and sadly it killed him. And then here, honey, just looking, is she going to cross the Mara River, which at times she did. And so we come to one particular part of the story. So 2005, Toto, honey, a drama. And that story continued through filming. Honey and Toto disappeared. Sometimes later, Honey reappeared without Toto. We knew he hadn't made it. So many dangers. Lions and hyenas probably would have been the cause. But the following year, so now um, 2000, so that was 2005, 2006, Angie found Honey with uh, four cubs on the other side of the river. And eventually she, uh, in fact, she had five to begin with, but eventually... She was just down to three cubs, and they became known as Honey's Boys. And there was a tragic ending to Honey's life, because at some point, the vets decided, with good intentions, to treat one of the male cubs who had torn a dew claw. And when they came to the situation, this wasn't Kashmiri, he had sadly passed by them. But when the vets came down, they decided to dart Honey as well. Now, we knew, but they didn't, because... In 2004, when we darted Honey to treat her for mange, she reacted really badly. And at one point, she abandoned the cubs when she came round. It was a really difficult, difficult time. But she didn't take well to the drug. And when she was darted in February 2007, um, it was decided to dart her as well as the cub that needed treating. And sadly, she started to convulse and she wasn't put into the shade. She wasn't wetted down. Her eyes weren't covered. And while the vets then actually went about actually getting the male cub sedated to treat him, and they did, um, Honey actually was having the most terrible time. Eventually, the cub was treated, was given the antidote, so was Honey. They were left to recover. And sadly, 
honey died. Just the most awful tragedy. The vets had the right intention. It was one of those interventions that was meant to be helpful. Um, you know, we won't question why it happened particularly. We learned a lot of lessons from it. We know that there are far tighter protocols now. You always have to wet down an animal that has been uh, immobilized because they lose their ability to naturally regulate their temperature. So you put down a wet cloth across them, you blindfold them so as they can't see because even though they're sedated, they're still taking information and so they don't get stressed out. But sadly, February 2007 was the end of Honey's stories, story. But then her three cubs, the three males who we called Honey's boys, weren't quite old enough and experienced enough to survive on their own. So the rangers actually helped provide them with kills. And within a few months, at one point, they attached themselves to another mum cheetah who had cubs, younger cubs, and they sort of parasitized some of the kills and they got through that, helped with the rangers, and then they crossed the river and then their journey as adults gradually unfolded. And I mean, they, they were a sight to see three males together, so confident, terrorizing other males in the area. I mean, they could basically dominate the whole landscape, mating with females whenever they could, uh, siring lots of cubs, uh, a tremendous success story and a lovely sort of end, a lovely sort of, well, a lovely continuity in a way of Honey's legacy. So thank you so much and look forward to next time. Bye-bye.